eternal tree of creation, reaching with its roots up into the sky and with its branches down to the earth, its roots remain resplendent and immortal, and in its branches the worlds come to rest. There is nothing beyond that. Indian religion, philosophy, and mythology, and the devotional fervor of Indian poet saints, coupled with his own decades-long devotion to the sage Raman Maharshi, inspires the luminous text image paintings of V. Ramesh. Drawn to the transgressive lives, words, tone, and tenor of four female bhakti saints who lived in different times and places, V. Ramesh strives to express these poets' exuberant and nuanced sensations of passion, piety, tranquility, and intimacy, as well as insights regarding the truth of our existence. Living and working in the coastal town of Visha Kapandam in Andhra Pradesh and a professor of art at Andhra University, V. Ramesh's luminous lessons carry forward an uncanny synchronicity of timeless and timely sentiment. Voices from the past with boundless and abundant relevance for our society and times. I belong to a Hindu family, but I think we never were a very ritualistic or great temple going family. So in, in that sense, there was no idea of connecting with specific rituals or a place or region. I was fortunate enough to have been belonging to that generation of people who had grandmothers living at home and who told amazing stories to me when I was there. To make me do my homework, to eat my dinner, you know, you were told stories and that perhaps have remained as part of my psyche or as part of my whole belief system over the years. 1988, call it a set of circumstances or call it by chance or a miracle, I happened to land in this place called Ramanasham. Ramanasham is a place near Chennai uh, where this great sage called Raman Maharshi used to live for almost 50 years. He passed away in 1950. Going there to the ashram perhaps opened up so much for me. The face of Ramana for me was so full of kindness and compassion that I had to paint him. However cliched it sounds. Uh, that's the only homage I thought I could pay to him for having opened up my heart to the world around me. Uh, Ramana spoke of, of, a bank, of, of Advaita, a term in Indian philosophy which I think is all inclusive. Uh, it talks of the oneness, uh, the unity of all existence and beings in the sense that we are no different from each other, essentially, though our external manifestations of our bodies or brains might be totally different across geographical locations and cultures. So in that sense, um, the sense of unity, uh, of oneness, is what perhaps moved me. I started reading, Ramanasham is an amazing, extensive, beautiful library where you would sit for hours and pour over all kinds of books. The stories which I read, the poems which I reread back, some of the stories came back to me uh, from my old days of childhood and perhaps this time they struck a deeper chord in me. And thus, a body of work and a show called A Thousand and One Desires began. There were stories which came back to me from mythology, from epics, uh, from all kind of things. And yet, uh, I could very meaningfully connect them to the kind of world I was living in. A Thousand and One Desires also uh, refers perhaps to the kind of greed and avarice all of us have inbuilt within us, the kind of consumerist uh, societies we were living in. And this was a kind of critique. It had images, some old images, reference to Indian mythology, like the image of Indra, the Indian god who was cursed uh, to have had thousand eyes all over his body because apparently he desired everything he saw. So I painted an image with a human figure with thousand eyes all over his body with uh, all kind of consumable things which you see in 
magazines, there's a car, there are music systems, all kind of things painted around him. There was a painting called A Thousand One Desires again where I had divided the canvas into thousand squares and asked every person who walked into my studio to paint one desire of theirs on each square. After a couple of years, I kind of appropriated in a symbolic act all those desires and turned out a painting. In fact, that was the earliest, one of the earliest work where I used an image of a bhakti poet with a few lines from him where he disdains all worldly materialistic positions and craves for some kind of uh, <clears throat> deliverance. So there was this contrast where I was actually appropriating a thousand desires from other people at the same time aspiring for a kind of austerity in, in, in the words of this medieval poet. There was always this contradiction which was played out on the surface of the canvas of, of what I was, what I was part of a larger society and yet what in a way I think I aspired to be or I would like to be where one could discard certain unnecessary notions and things. I always thought that Ramana's face was one of the most beautiful faces I've seen. It's not a very good looking face, but it's so full of compassion, kindness and understanding. I've seen people standing before it and just, I think one's problems are solved. I have faced it myself. So in a way for me, painting his face was almost like a ritualistic way of chanting. For me, painting it over and over again was like this chanting. It's been like meeting an old friend. My whole body of work which came after this post uh, visiting Ramanasis was so exuberant. It's so full of uh, things and color and all kind of things happening that perhaps I needed all this exuberance, all these things coming into my work to actually talk of a certain kind of simplicity and exuberance. Later, there were certain poets whom I have whom I had read when I was a student, all of them had a similar tone and tenor in their manner of speaking and writing and singing. There was a sense of urgency, there was a sense of pleading, affection, love, anger, all shades of human emotions would be part of the work in search of this uh, truth or in search of uh, what they thought was the truth. And I needed a visual equivalency of the written word, which is what my search has been for the last uh, decade or so. I use snatches of text, of poetry, lines which I am moved by. I use it, incorporate it along with my images, hoping that they would have the same they would perhaps move somebody who sees them in the same way they have moved me when I first read them. And uh, so this has been a, a constant striving, I would say, is to find a visual equivalency to the written word. Sometimes I despair, sometimes I envy uh, writers. A few words and they can evoke a whole kind of emotional landscape, which I cannot do with, with, with my color, with, with the kind of vocab, visual color, vocabulary I have at hand. And that's perhaps one of the reasons that I keep uh, moving between these different modes of languages. Sometimes I do very realistically, sometimes it's almost abstract, sometimes I use a lot of linear elements, sometimes I use text, sometimes I quote from other paintings. So there's a kind of desperation to, to be able to come to that emotional intensity. Bhakti can be translated into English as devotion. Now all cultures across the world, all religions have had their share of devotional hymns, devotional poetry, saints. India specifically for some historical reason, I think that uh, the roots or the seeds of Bhakti movement was sown in the south around 8th to 10th century. Um, these poets who were also great devotees 
would actually wander and they did not most of them did not belong to what you call as the upper castes they belong to a whole spectrum of uh, castes lower caste they belong to various professions they were not just from the priestly uh, class which had access to education they were porters they were weavers uh, they were women who were moved by the notion of a personal relationship with what i can call as divinity or god so in forging these bonds to god you formed your own rules you formed your own regulations you cross the boundary sometimes you did everything which went against the notions of what you are supposed to do as part of a society i am very interested in them because they broke all norms they broke all prescribed notions of worship which is part of your uh, structural uh, structured religion uh, and uh, and came out with emotional outpourings which are so uh, which are so touching and beautiful and yet their work contained a kind of their work was a kind of critique and a commentary on the then prevalent social norms um, certain kind of hierarchically held notions some of these poets i have painted them uh, quite a number of times this woman poet called karikal amma um, who is always depicted as a old hag which pretty woman would ask a boon from god to make her look ugly so that no man would desire her or look at her uh, but i also see it in a larger context the times we live in of uh, being freed from all notions of beauty and a certain kind of physicality which an attractive person is supposed to be endowed with but here was a woman who kind of negated all that kind of physicality then of course as i said this akamaha devi who belonged to a 12th century from karnataka different state different two cent what seven centuries later again a tamil woman poet called andal whom i have painted for the first time in the sanctum sanctorum uh, symbolically as a garland now there is very lovely beautiful story of andal the young poet was a young girl whose father was a temple priest and used to make garlands for the presiding deity in the temple now the girl fell in love with the temple deity or god and without her father's knowing would wear the garland before it was taken to the temple and put which is supposed to be sacrilegious they are not meant to wear it till one day the father realizes what the girl has been up to and gets very angry makes a new garland and takes it to the temple that night he has a dream as the story goes where he is told that i want the garland worn by your daughter because i miss the scent of her body smell now that has uh, so much of uh, connotations of intimacy between a devotee and god this kind and also a kind of sensualness which is so much part of all this bhakti movement so i had in fact i had painted a whole garland uh, with verses of hers written by her in the background um then you of course you have this great kashmiri poet called lal dad who lived in the 14th century kashmir again a woman very radical wandered round naked across the landscape never bothered about uh, what she called has the physical structure the skin and bones and yet she wrote poetry of such deep understanding of the frailties of human spirit of a kind of disdain for the outer physical body which we have all these four women poets i have chosen precisely because their voice has so much of similarity the kind of things which they disdain the kind of things which they talk of so approvingly um, the kind of intensity of uh, emotions in their work divided as they were across centuries and geographical locations i presume in their if i may use the word spiritual experience or some kind of emotional experience there has to be a similarity there has to be some kind of uh, similar nature of experience which they must have had which brings in that kind of similarity of tone and tenor in their in what they wrote and 
spoke. It's not a question of we living in 21st century being concerned about certain issues. People living across centuries, across geographical locations, can have transformative experiences which changes their whole attitude to the way you look at life, to the way you look at world at large, to your whole relationship with people and your society around you. And that for me is a very uh, interesting thing.